um, to do that, you need to construct various forces and strategize an attack. Um, so, uh, that's my dog. Sorry. Oh my <laughs> god, that was really weird. <laughs> I thought, what the hell is that? <laughs> that was so He's having weird. a bad dream. <laughs> well, that, that's that's so the re- clip. That's the opening clip for the podcast. <laughs> <or weird. laughs> Hello and welcome to episode 11 of Podwap. I'm Ollie, with me as always is Tibbs. Hello. A rather under the weather Tibbs uh, today I'm afraid. A little bit, yeah. Yeah, a little bit, soldiering on. Um, but for the first time ever in the in the long history of our podcast, we've got a third person. We've got a special guest. His name is Vic and he's from Retro Electro. Hello Vic. Hiya, good to hear you all. Yeah, good to hear, good to hear you. Thank you for coming on. So I might be the last guest you ever have if this doesn't go too well, but (laughs) no, I think it'll be fine. Um, So yeah, Retro Electro. If you've uh, never heard of it, we've talked about it before. Uh, You make uh, models of consoles. Well, one console so far, but one um, so far. Yep, one so far. Yeah, little little Mega Drive. We both got one. I think this. I think it's fantastic. I think Tibbs does as well. Yeah, good. I do. Um, Yeah, I can't wait to talk to you about it. Um, But first, we're going to uh, start off how we traditionally start off. And talk about the games that we've been playing lately. So, um, as our guest, Vic, well, um, I hope you don't mind starting us off. What you've been playing? What you've been up to lately? Sure. Um, I'd like to say that I've been playing lots of games, but obviously, starting up a new business uh, means that most of my time has been uh, working. But um, I've actually been playing Beat Saber uh, on Oculus Rift. Oh, yeah. Perhaps more than most things because it's a bit of a you know pick up and have a 10 minute go of something um yeah it's pretty good I don't know if you've played it i don't think i've heard of that what is it beat sabers um a, think guitar hero with lightsabers oh cool so obviously it's a vr game in vr yeah, um, yeah. yeah mm. and you get these colored blocks come towards you um to the to the beat of a music mm. um and you have a lightsaber in each hand and you basically just have to smash the blocks of your lightsaber as they come towards you Oh, that's pretty um, cool. And they have different triangular arrows, arrows on them to sort of swipe left, swipe right, up, down. Um, and honestly, it's it's fantastic. I think it's the first um, VR game to sell over a million copies. Oh, cool. uh, even my wife has played it and she's never played a video game in her life. <laughs> um, and you know, what? it's one of those games as well that you, you when you actually get quite good at a song, mm. you start to really think that you look the business when you're playing it. You know, you start actually sort of swiping your hands in quite long arcs as if you're sort of, you know, some sort of breakdancing Jedi Knight. It's uh, it's really, really cool, actually. Very good game. Oh, brilliant. I missed, okay. what, what format were you playing that on? Was that on PSVR or...? Uh, Oculus. Oh, Oculus Rift, cool. On the PC, yeah. Yeah, yeah the so. PC version's the way to go with it, I think, because you get all the, you know, the sort of mods and song mod packs and stuff. Yep, yep, yep. And I never get tired of VR, to be honest with you. I really do. It's a shame it's not... Um, quite as accessible yet because you need a pretty high spec PC and obviously mm. yeah. um, it's a little bit like uh, you know going out for a night you can never really be bothered to get off your backside and actually get out but once you do you really enjoy it and yeah. VR is a little bit like that you know you can't be bothered to yeah. put the headset on but um, <laughs> even after two years it still uh, never ceases to amaze me how amazing it actually looks when you when you put the headset on and you, you know, disappear into some sort of virtual world so yeah, absolutely. Hopefully, agree. it improves over the next couple of gens. But yeah, so. I think it will. I must admit, I've I have tried VR a couple of times, but I don't have my own headset or anything. But uh, yeah, it's interesting to watch it grow and the kind of games that come out for it. I think, you know, so it sort of started off getting quite sort of gimmicky games, but now you're getting sort of quite interesting kind of ideas, aren't you? Yeah, I mean, you, you know, um, I've got Elite Dangerous on it, and oh, yes. and it's one of those things that is. It would always go down in one of like the defining gaming moments of my life, and obviously I've been playing games for forty years. Mm. Um, but the sense of distance between yourself and the cockpit of the spaceship, and then that infinite space beyond the window, and and it's absolutely incredible. I mean, it's mm. almost quite scary when you play it because mm. you actually do feel like you're just floating around in space yeah. in a tiny little ship. 
Yeah, um, I can imagine. Yeah. It's it's oh. it's really cool. Oh, I've only got the the PSVR because my my PC is nowhere near powerful enough to to run you know to run a Rift or a, a HTC yeah. Vive or anything like that. But and uh, the uh, Eve um, uh, Valkyrie Elite, yeah, uh, Elite yeah. doesn't have PSVR um, support, but Eve Valkyrie does, mm. and it's just it's that same sort of thing. When you're in the cockpit, um, the sense of scale you get is just it's just phenomenal you you know yeah. it's yeah it's it's hard to describe unless you actually sort of experience it but yeah it's a, it's amazing yeah yeah so and you I would played say, a bit of that yeah Good. i would say as well what i found about vr i mean if anyone's playing pot up bingo at home i'm about to mention tetris effect again but it's the <laughs> fact that you know tetris effect in vr you know you, you who would think that vr would add anything to tetris but mm. it's it it just proved to me that there's so much more you know we haven't even begun to sort of tap into what vr can can really do yet it's not just you know first person shooters and space sims and stuff it can add so much to even sort of games you wouldn't yeah. think would have anything you know to the vr could add well it allows you to focus doesn't it on on something like tetris that's the thing mm, it kind definitely. of blocks out the rest mm. of the world and you know mm. just completely immerses you in what you're trying to actually achieve um yeah, so that's definitely. good yeah yeah. Um, other than that, I've just been playing a few old retro games like eSWAT on the Mega Drive and a few other bits and pieces that I can just sort of load up, have a couple of goes on. Um, I find myself spending most of my time actually just trying to sort out like a a, a select uh, collection of emulated games on my PC <laughs> with all of the cover art and the screenshots and, and everything and just kind of curating it and... It's you know, funny you say that. The library, you know, yeah, I'm e- I'm exactly the same. I spend more time managing ROMs yeah. than I do playing. <laughs> yes, yeah. I've got yeah, because I've got my Raspberry Pi, and um, yeah, I'm just uh, at the moment I'm in the middle of making like a theme for it. Like each um, system has its own like theme and own artwork for it and stuff. And, and you're like, as you say, like curating like the ROMs because you don't want the every single ROM in there. It would just take too long to go through and you're never going to play most of them. Absolutely. Yep. But yeah, just narrowing down that list, you know, and thinking, oh, okay, I'd like to quite quite try that, you know, put that in and, and kind of finding games that I'd never even heard of as well and, and just yeah. seeing, oh, I'd like to put that in. Yeah, yeah I it's, think it's, um, ROM collection is one of those things that when you when they first sort of came out, you kind of, oh, well, I've got to get the complete set. Yeah. And then you realise that a complete set of Spectrum games is like 40,000 games or something. <laughs> um, yeah. And you, no one wants to scroll through a library of those. No. Um, so mm. I ended up actually just a couple of evenings sitting there with, with every platform and going, what were my favourite games of the system? What were the best-selling games of the system? What were the games with a lot of his- historical significance? Mm. And kind of just coming up with these short lists of maybe like 30, 40 games for each system. Yeah, um, you know, I mean, it's, it's much more manageable. Um, it's definitely the way to go. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's yeah. good. Mm. And that's then you it, kind that's of, for me. yeah, and you could, your list kind of expands as you sort of find more. I, I find anyway. Yeah, I've yeah, got, definitely. I've got definitely. sort of about hundred Mega Drive games in mind, and I'm now looking at other ones to add. I'm, I think I'm going to end up with like a hundred more, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> which it's is not a very narrow you know, you've, you've, you know, you've you've picked them. That's right. They're hand selected. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting you say that, yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, Tibbs, what have you been up to then? Um, I've played uh, Windjammers okay. on Switch because the uh, limited run put out a physical copy of mine, j- mine arrived today. Hmm. Um, so I've been playing quite a bit of that. Is um, that the original one or is because the, there's yes. a sequel coming, isn't there? That's not out yet, is it? It's not out yet. The sequel's coming. It's from the same guys who are doing the, the Streets of Rage 4. Yeah. So, um, yeah. you know, it should be good. But, um, yeah, I played a bit of that today. It's, it's, it's quite good fun. I'd never played it before. I'd heard of it. So mm. I sort of took a chance on that one, thinking it'd be all right. And the fact is, I thought I would probably get the second one. And if they release a physical of that, I can't have, you know, a physical copy of Windjammers 2 on my shelf without Windjammers 1 being next to it. <laughs> it would just play Havoc with me. So I, I thought... <laughs> I better, That's better get pretty both. much my entire business model. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so I played a bit of that. Um, I played some of the... Um, I bought the Phoenix Wright trilogy um, that they've just released again on Switch. Um, they haven't got physical release in the UK, so I had to import it. That's come out um, on the Switch, But I've been playing it? that again. Oh, right. I didn't know that was out on the Switch. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really, oh, okay. it's, really, it's uh, Switch. I think I think it's out on PS4 and Xbox as well. Actually, I think it's like a, a all all major systems release. But oh, I, right. Switch seemed the obvious choice to me because it's you know mm. a good game to play portably if you're out and about. So, yeah, um, I've never I, played them, but I'd imagine they're touch screen heavy, aren't they? Because they're on the DS originally. How have they got around that if it's on like PS4 and that? Um, it's quite easy to to get around it. I mean, most of the um, the bulk of the game, the the trials and stuff, can be controlled quite easily with you know just menu options. Okay. Um, and the investigation side of the um, uh, the game acts more like a point and click kind of thing. So you just mm. sort of move a mouse cursor around and inve- you know investigate areas of the screen and stuff like that. So okay. it doesn't lose anything at all by being um, you know on a console rather than on the touch screen. So. Right. Okay. Yeah, it's really good. Um, I won't say too much because it's definitely a game we're going to cover on a, on a future show at some point. Yeah, so, yeah. um, besides that, I've been like I've been tweeting. I've been trying to get to grips with the uh, game maker a bit. So trying yeah. to to get my head around that. I've not done any any actual coding since my Commodore sixty four. So, <laughs> um, and a bit of Turbo Pascal in college. Um, I'm not it's sure that's used for nowadays. anything. <laughs> It is, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, it is, absolutely. <laughs> so, yeah, I've been just trying to get my head around that, really, and, uh, yeah, that's been quite fun. Um, but the rest of the time, it's been a bit, yeah, I haven't had much much time outside of that to be to be playing many games, so it's just been a bit it's sort of dribs and drabs here and there, fitting in what I can, really. Yeah, one of those months, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. But how cool. about you? Uh, yeah, not not too bad. I had, um, in between the last episode and this one, I've had uh, a birthday. So I'm another year older, but um, well, I, what did you get for your birthday? I got. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, it's funny you should say. <laughs> um, <laughs> I got two games. Um, one of them is um, Starlink: Battle for Atlas on Switch. Oh yeah, yeah. That's the one with the Star Fox uh, version in it. So mm. that that was the um, like the Toys to Life thing. It came out uh, initially. It came out at like sixty quid, and then about a month later, it it dropped down to like twenty and stayed there. So I'm guessing it yeah. didn't sell particularly well. But it's um it's still a pretty good game and well worth it for you know twenty quid you get that model with the, the you know the um, the R wing model with it which is almost worth you know a fair portion of that price anyway but uh, yeah it's good I haven't played loads of it yet but it's it's just kind of like a sort of a, a shooter with a bit of No Man's Sky element to it I think I don't think it, the the worlds are procedurally generated but they're you know they they have that sort of look about them you kind of explore these alien worlds and shoot bad guys and stuff so it's um yeah it's a pretty good game um yeah but more than that i've been playing um spider-man on ps4 oh uh, yes yeah really good. and it's really really good it's really good a, a, a lot of people say it's good it is very it's really fun yeah um because i'm not really a comic book guy as i was such gonna any, say any i wouldn't, I wouldn't have pegged you as a, a comic book guy really no but you really don't have to be to enjoy this game it's just it's really it's just fun the, the, the whole web swimming swinging mechanic around the city is really fun you know you feel like a superhero the the the, uh, the fighting mechanics are really you know kind of intuitive and really kind of powerful um but the like the the city that you're in isn't just like a city that looks a bit like New York because I went to New York about five years ago, and this city basically is New York. Like the layout, as far as I can see, is is kind of perfect. You know, it it really feels like you're going back there, albeit swinging around. Obviously, I wasn't doing that last time. Um, uh, so yeah, it was it's amazing just trying to find all these sort of landmarks and and stuff. You know. And um, yeah, it's just it's just really because I don't play AAA games very often, uh, but when I do, I'm always kind of amazed at what's possible now. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Like, like how have they <laughs> have they done this? It's insane. The amount of hours that must have gone into it is incredible. But um, yeah, it's a real again. I'm not too far ahead into it, about ten percent, I think. But uh, you know, it's 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 a good game, very good game. Didn't, I'd recommend checking it out. Didn't they put like an Easter egg in that game where? Some guy wanted to propose to his girlfriend, and they there's like a cinema or something there. And if you if certain conditions are met, it will sort of display a um, so and so will you marry me kind of thing on 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 the yes, screen. And it turned out that, that she yeah. turned out right. she said no, or she cheated on him or something. Oh my god! So they, they <laughs> and they had to out, patch it out. Yeah. <laughs> That's incredible. It's what a awful. great story. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh well. Yeah. Poor uh, no, I didn't hear about that. Yeah. Mm. It's funny what you're saying about um, being accurate to, to New York. I think mm. the first game that I ever played where I was 
where they did something similar as Metropolis Street Racer on the Dreamcast. I don't yeah. know if you ever played I love, that. I love that game. It's really, it was really absolutely good amazing. And yeah. that yeah. really was like it, all the, the shops in London were just scanned in yes. sort of and stuck in the correct streets and stuff. And uh, yeah. yeah, brilliant game that. Really, really good racing game. Good soundtrack as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, I think it's probably one of the best racing games I've ever played, actually. It's yeah, really good. I really, I it's really amazing. Like it. You can still find sealed copies of that on eBay. It's crazy, and yeah. for like not not expensive prices either. Like, yeah. it, it blows my mind that there's so many copies out there just mm. you know unbought. It's it's just a shame. It's an amazing game. I know because it was kind of followed up by Project Gotham. Is That's that right? right. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. 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 I I didn't play. I've got a few of them. I haven't really played any of them very much. Um, but what I have, I, I just, it didn't capture me as much as Metropolis Street Racer for some reason. I don't know why. I, I love the ghost mode on on that as well, which was mm. I think that's always. I mean, obviously people play racing games in different ways. I always had the most fun with two racing games, which was actually via demos. And one was uh, Sega Rally on the Saturn, mm. and the, or the demo on Sega Saturn magazine, and then the demo for Metropolis Street Racer before I got the full game. And there's something quite nice about being limited to one track because it's a yes. demo, yeah. and just <laughs> continuously trying to get a faster time. Mm. Yeah, and I think yeah, sometimes absolutely. with games like Forza and what have you they're so big you sort of do a race and then you move on to the next one you move <laughs> on to the next one and it yeah. largely just seems to be ram as many cars out of the way as possible and just hold on to the first place and I think there's something to be said for going back to that kind of just trying to trim seconds off of the same yeah. track over and uh, over, yeah. I know over again I know exactly yeah. what you mean I had the same um, experience with when Gran Turismo the first Gran Turismo came out and they had the, a demo on the PlayStation magazine it was just like one track and I don't think I think it was time limited so you couldn't even do like more than a few laps I think you yeah. got like a lap and a bit um, and I, it was it was literally that it was it became you know my version of Gran Turismo was just trying to shave every sort of millisecond off just doing my personal best round and round and round that track you know and I got right. I got I knew it like the back of my hand by the end of it yeah, yeah. I think racing games have lost a lot of focus actually on, on what a lot of people like about them which is why they've suddenly become a bit of a niche genre in, in many ways people, when yeah. people talk about racing games they're either talking about your Mario Kart type ones which everyone wants to play but they're not really racing games and then even things like Gran Turismo have kind of taken this sort of you have to be a racing fan to want to play Gran Turismo yeah. mm. uh, and it never used to be the case 20, 30 years ago racing games were considered no different from you know FPS shooters or anything else really no yeah. that's true actually yeah. yeah it was a big sort of staple genre really mm. initially and now yeah you don't get yeah you don't get quite so many of them anymore really do you? Yeah. as you say they fall into those two categories you know I mean, I'm actually thinking about it, I'm wondering if a lot of genres are kind of moved hmm. to the sidelines, like your, your 2D beat-em-ups. Um, hmm. I mean, when you consider how big Street Fighter 2 was with everybody, hmm. and now the Street Fighter series is, you, you know, you've got to be really into your your fighting games and do your frame counting and all that sort of stuff yeah. to, to be right yeah. into them. Yeah. So I think actually probably the middle ground's just been taken over by either FPSs or third-person games like Grand Theft Auto. And every other genre has sort of almost taken, become niche in a way. Mm. Yeah, um, it's interesting, isn't it? I never really thought about it like that. But yeah, yeah it's almost like they've all specialised in, like everyone who's ever interested in them has gone down these sort of routes and got more and more intense as a result. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Mm. Same with shooters. Yeah. You know, yeah. Every, everyone would have a shoot them up, whether it was Gradius or, you know, Thunder Force or whatever. Mm. And now it's like, no, you've got to be able to dodge. <laughs> Five thousand bullets with one eye closed. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, that's right. Yeah, using your mouth to control the joystick, otherwise yeah. you're crap. Yeah, that's funny. I I was listening to a podcast earlier, and there was a guy talking about a, a new shoot, new shoot 'em up on the Switch. I can't remember what it's called now, but I I looked it up, and I thought, oh, that sounds really good because it was supposed to be like Thunder Force and that. But yeah, I saw the trailer, and as you say, it was just like bullets everywhere, and I'm like, yeah. that, that's <laughs> a that's really difficult, and b that's just going to send me into a seizure or something. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One of yeah. my favourite arcade games was 1942, and it's probably one of mm. those games that I think everyone has an arcade game which they can show off a little bit next to <laughs> normies when they're watching you play an arcade game. And 1942 was my game, which I actually could do really quite well on, you know, 10p. Um, and you look at the pace of that game compared to the, the point where I stopped playing shooters was when Ikaruga came out. 
yeah. And and I gave that, you know, I bought it. Oh, I love a good shoot 'em up. Played it, and I was just like, no, I can't, <laughs> I can't do this. This is too frustrating. And then you go back yeah. and play something like nineteen forty two, and you just sort of think the pace is just so different. Mm. Um, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if the people that are actually very good at playing modern day shooters could probably almost do something like nineteen forty two without ever playing it before <laughs> and yeah. just work their way through it. Yeah. But uh, yeah, no, it's um, it's a shame, really. As I said, we, we seem to be largely limited to a, a number of big selling genres, and everything else takes us mm. takes a side step. Certainly in the AAA space, it does seem to yeah. have distilled down to to a few key genres, and everything else, you know, is it's all indie developers out there that are sort mm. of taking care of things. I think. Yeah, yeah. It's like I said uh, in the last episode. Um, the good thing about the indies is that no matter what your niche is, there's, there'll be someone out there who probably wants to fill it. Do you know what I yeah. mean? Like. You know, there'll be someone making those kind of old, old school shoot 'em up somewhere. You know, where it's nice and simple, and yeah, like the, the awesome people can do it, and there's no with no problems. But that's not really the point. You know, it's about getting that original kind of feel of it. So, um, Retro Electro is uh, is your company, Vic. Yes. Um, could you could you describe anyone who's never heard of it? Could you describe what you do and what you're sort of aiming to do? Well, um, my tagline at the moment when I speak to people about it is that I want to essentially be the Funko of uh, games, consoles, and home computers, um, which is probably the best way of describing it. But at the same time, I've noticed that a lot of people have a bit of a loathing for Funko now, probably because they're so pervasive everywhere. Um, but as far as the what we're trying to achieve with it, that's that's really it. I want to get to the point where um, there isn't a games console or home computer, no matter how niche or how rare, um, that we don't ultimately end up producing a model for. Oh, nice. Um, <laughs> you, you know, because I think part of the reason why I had the idea in the first place is I wanted to actually get in and start rebuying some of the old systems that I had, which I'd sold you know, for next to nothing, as we probably all did before yeah. we realised that we were worth holding on to. Um, and also to get hold of some systems that I couldn't have when I was a child, like the PC Engine or the Neo Geo, because they were too expensive or whatever. Um, and not really having the money or the space to, to buy them now. I certainly haven't got the space. Um, so for me, it was kind of, you know, I'd quite like to just have these little scale models that I could have a shelf full of, um, and really appreciate either the ones that I had myself from a nostalgic point of view or the systems that I, I never could get. You know, the PC engine with the with the CD attachment, I think, would look absolutely great. Mm. Um, so it was that kind of thing. Um, and then I sort of thought, well, actually, it, you know, where do you stop? Do you just do the, you know, the main big big systems or, or do you try and do some more niche systems like the Vectrex, um, uh, you know, systems that you would, would have seen in, video game magazines but you know wouldn't have bought because that ultimately ended up being failures a lot of the time um and i think that's one of the big selling points with funko i think if funko had just come out for example in the early days with uh a, you know a bobblehead of the x-men and that was it i don't think people would have batted an eyelid i think the thing that really made people take note of funko is you'd go to things like comic-con and you'd see that they had characters from breaking bad or yeah. Game mm. of Thrones, and it was this the thing of the more franchises they added, the more appealing the collections become. Um, so I want to try and do something similar, you know. Even if I'm talking about things like the Sam Coupe, which a lot of people haven't even heard of before. Um, no, you know, I can't say I've heard of that. <laughs> the, the Sam Coupe was um, it was like a a pseudo sequel to the Spectrum. So oh. it was. Uh, a Z80 based system but with a 16 bit graphics chip if I remember rightly so it had much better it had graphics on par with perhaps the Atari ST um, but it was basically a Sinclair Spectrum from a you know processor point of view so it would actually run Spectrum software but with but was upgraded um, and the hope was it would be a really good path for people to take from you know getting rid of the Spectrum because the 16 bit systems were starting to take over um, and I actually had one but we uh, I, I well, my dad slung it away when, when we moved, 
and it was all boxed. And they go on eBay now for about a thousand pound. Oh man! Because they, say, they I'm just really were. At them now. It's a really nice looking system as well. Yeah, yeah, they were a really poor selling system. Um, the Amiga just basically dominated by that point, so it was probably a little mm. bit um, late to the party. Um, but yeah, no, it was, it's, it's well worth sort of digging in. They've still got a sm- small little fan base, as these systems often do. Um, but you know that's that's what I think would be quite cool about it to to release a model of the Sam Coupe for people that haven't even seen it, just you know all adds to that kind of history of you know, of games, consoles, and computer systems. Um, oh yeah. Mm. But of course, you can't easily just produce a Sam Coupe as you know the second model because there's there's no viable market for it until you've actually established the brand as a series of collectibles. Yeah. Um, you know, to be quite honest with you, once you've actually got a series of collectibles, people, you hope that people will then start to to buy the systems, even if they didn't particularly own the system. Yeah. Um, you know, so uh, yeah, I'm trying to kill two birds with one stone, really. Uh, you know, it's it's to appeal to the systems that people had, but also try and pay homage to the history of computing and video games, and you know, show all these old systems. Um, well, I think it's I think it's quite in the idea in general because I think. A lot of these systems, are, uh, the aesthetics of the system and the physical design of the system isn't something that a lot of people generally talk about or appreciate, is it? You know, no, it's something yeah, that's, yeah. that goes mm-hmm. really underappreciated. Yes. Um, I mean, I think that's actually one of the biggest hurdles that we've got to deal with is a lot of the time people will look at the system. Like if I do some of the, the um, video game markets and we'll, we'll have some the systems on sort of nice display stands and what have you... Um, you'll get quite a lot of people say, you know, does it play games? Which mm. becomes a little bit tiring after a while because, you you know, it's it's pretty obvious. There's no HDMI yeah. ports on yeah. it or USB <laughs> ports. Um, plus it's only, you know, 30, 35 quid. Um, yeah. Some people so, don't think they're getting a deal though. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it, it's trying to get people used to the fact of actually some of these systems were aesthetically quite pleasing mm. or, or very, or either, you know, pleasing from a, a an ergonomics point of view or just really colourful old systems I mean yeah. the GameCube in all of its many colours I think that would look great in a little miniature version oh yeah, um, yeah. Mm-hmm. you know and at the end of the day we can all play uh, the the games on Switch PS4 you could play them on your Wii via the Nintendo store you could download thousands of ROMs if you want to stick them on a Raspberry Pi so I personally have never really understood the idea of wanting to buy four or five mini systems that you plug into your TV just taking up more and more HDMI ports. Um, yeah. I'd rather play, this, play the games either on an original system or on a computer and then have a shelf of models to appreciate the the, you know, the look of the systems. Mm. Well, yeah, um, I mean, when you think about it, every aspect of, of games is, you know, you've got soundtracks for people who are into, you know, the, the music and stuff behind the games. You've got art books, you've got every kind of collectible and sort of every aspect of games has its own sort of subgenre of things appreciating it but the consoles themselves just there's nothing really is there no yeah no, and when we true. did some market research when the the NES mini came out and really took off um and i would say i can't remember the actual the number of people i i sort of did the questionnaire to but it was more than half said that they actually the primary reason for buying the NES Mini wasn't because it played games it was because it was a miniature NES you know it actually Mm. was the fact that they were looking at this NES and going oh my god how cute is it oh you know that would look lovely on my shelf and Mm. actually had nothing to do with the fact that they could play you know Super Mario Brothers on it because they could play that on as I said on their Wii uh, at the time anyway really so um, that was partly what sort of convinced me to, to push forward with this it's like if you can buy models of aeroplanes, you can buy models of Ferraris and Porsches, you can buy models of Sonic the Hedgehog and Mario, um, and it'd be a real shame if at no point you you can't go back and buy models of the Neo Geo, the PlayStation 2, the Dreamcast, the Mega Drive, you know, yeah. and all the other systems. So yeah. that's what we're aiming to do. Um, but it's tough. As I said, it's it's tough because it's not it's not been done before in this particular way. Um, and I think it's just getting that mindset through to people that, you know, if you if you did have these old systems, they're they're great nostalgic value to just stick on your desk or or, or wherever, um, and and not so much worry about playing the games side of things. Mm. It's, that's something different. Mm. Um, 
but I'm sure it'll get there. I think once we actually produce the second model, I think it will click with people in general more. I mean, you guys obviously got it straight away. Oh, yeah, um, yeah definitely. And, and lots of people do. And <coughs> um, uh, it's lovely to hear. Uh, I've, I've had nothing but positive feedback, touch wood. You oh, know, it's brilliant. Been, it's yeah. been very, very good. Yeah. Um, because look, I just want to let people know that as we're talking on this podcast, this isn't, I'm not a businessman that thought, oh, I'll try and monopolise on retro gaming. It's gaming is my life um, and always has been. Um, and I think that's why when I first went through the design process with this and I was speaking to Sega about getting the license in, I didn't want to stop at just producing the actual console itself because I thought, well, that doesn't really tick all of the boxes in my mind as to uh, for the nostalgia. You know, I wanted to look at the retail box as well because that was part and parcel of it. You know, you get a Mega Drive for, for Christmas or whatever and it was opening that original box, which is why we ended up doing a sort of miniature of the box as well mm. um, and the controller and a, and a a game medium whether that's a cartridge or a cd or dvd or whatever um so we wanted to actually make sure we produced absolutely everything that you that you would get with the original system short short of some av cables because you know what's the point in that <laughs> yeah <laughs> little model so, av cables is really yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a brilliant package i gotta say i've got it right i've got mine right in front of me actually um and yeah the attention to detail on the con on the car on the console itself is incredible you know i just you compare it to the real thing and it's just you know, you've got yeah. everything where it should be, all the, all the curves, all the, you know, all the actual switches will work. You know, you can move them up and down. The It's surprisingly is, difficult, is actually, to get. It, it did take us, um, as far as the design part, probably took us 12 months of going back, um, getting the production changed a bit, getting samples sent through to us. You know, it's not quite right. Um, even the colours... Um, it's what the really uh, this is interesting to me it might bore your audience to tears but the the white on the system for the reset button um the mega drive uh text and the white of the where the led is on the on the front of the mega drive mm. they're all different to look at but they're they're different because of the surfaces that they're on so on an original Mega Drive, when you look at it, the, the reset button actually looks a little bit grey. Yeah. Uh, and the, the white around the LED looks almost pure brilliant white. And the white of the Sega Mega Drive wording is like in between the two. Mm. The reason they actually all come out different isn't because they're different shades of white. It's because the reset button's actually made of white plastic, which ultimately ends up coming out a bit grey. The, the white around the reset, uh, the LED is actually on gloss plastic. So it automatically comes out looking a little bit brighter. Mm. And then the white of the Sega is actually on the matte plastic. So that by by natural printing process on the original system, they come out the way they do. Of course, when you're doing the model and the reset button is actually paint instead of white plastic, you have to try and match the colours in a slightly different way. Uh, so all, all of that sort of stuff is real. You know, the, the, the first ones come back and the whites are just all over the shop. Um so yeah, and there's even the hole on the back of the Mega Drive, which I don't know if you've seen. Yes, um, yeah. serves serves no purpose on an original Mega Drive, but we made sure it was on there because it's <laughs> it's it's on the original. Uh, so yeah, I, th- I would say the only if I was going to be critical of my own system, the only caveat we made as far as the model itself was the the AV ports, um, and the reason that they're actually painted as opposed to molded is that we want to try and do various variants of the Mega Drive. And the various variants of the Mega Drive had different AV ports. So like the yeah, very early did, versions yeah. had the extension port on them, which got removed on subsequent versions. Mm. Um, if we injection molded those segments onto the model, then it would have required a completely new mold for every variant, which wouldn't have been, we wouldn't have been able to produce really just from no. right. a cost okay. benefit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we took the decision that if we was going to release like an Altered Beast first version of the Mega Drive and a Japanese variant and the US variant hmm. um, that we'd have to just leave that bit painted on because then we could paint the actual ports we went we wanted to be accurate to the versions more so than you know uh, having them sort of just plastic holes if you like yeah yeah um, so you know so you have to make those sort of decisions sometimes but no I think that was the right decision to make as you as you say I mean um, and it's on the back anyway so exactly yeah no, no one has it facing the back on their shelf, do they? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. It's as I say, it's it's brilliant. Um, so, 
what was your background? I, I've curi- out of curiosity, do you have a product design kind of background? Did, no, did I'm, you... a, I'm a um, computer program software developer. Oh, okay, right. That's um, interesting. Yeah. So, how so if you want if you want any advice, Terry? Then uh... I was going to say, yeah, I might have to <laughs> take you up on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, that yeah. That's... So, uh, yeah, that's what, that's what I I do for a living. Um, but yeah, it's the 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 games model thing was just something that I thought no I'm I've got to try it. I've yeah. had various other business ventures throughout my life um, of varying degrees of success, mm. um, but getting into gaming at some point was was what I always wanted to do, and this seemed like a reasonably good avenue. Yeah, right. um, so games programming itself is far too difficult. Yeah, um, not difficult to do <laughs> necessarily, just to, you know, to actually just make a success of and actually get in, involved in. So. Um, yeah. This seemed like a quite a good one, um, and it was something that I wanted for myself. As I said, the the whole reason for doing it was because I haven't got the space or the money to have a big retro collection. So yeah, um, yeah. yeah, I know it's a, it's a great um, sort of uh, alternate really for for space. Certainly, you can have them all lined up, and they won't take up anywhere near as much room. Uh, the yeah. box again, I've I've still got a lot of my um, the boxes of my consoles actually sort of shoved up on a really high shelf in my room, just kind of desperately holding on to them while. I just lose having more space, but I can't get rid of them because, the, as you say, the box is important. That's what you saw when you open it up on Christmas morning, you know. Yeah. So that that was your first glimpse of the console, and you kind of want to hang on to it if you can. Um, so including the box is, along with the, contr- the the console and the con- control is a great idea. I mean, we all live in reasonably small houses over here as well. Yeah. Com- comparatively to the, you know, you, you look at the states. I mean, I'm a member of a lot of retro um, Facebook groups, mm. and. You, You'll see a lot of American retro fans sort of putting photographs of their collections, but they're often in their basements. I know, these yeah. massive basements full yeah. of shelves. And, and their basements yeah. are massive because they're pretty much <laughs> the square footage of the whole house almost. Um, and it's like, well, that's great. And it's, but I live in a, you know, a end of terraced house with uh, a wife and three kids and a dog and two rabbits. Um, my gaming room is literally a broom cupboard. You know, I yeah. feel like Philip Schofield in there. Yeah, uh, yeah. same I've, here. Same here. I've got stick about two, two probably two the same room. And you're yeah. done. That's it. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can I ask? Um, like you said, no one's really done something like this before. Um, and you said, you know, it might take a few sort of releases for people for it to really click with people and people to really get what you're trying to do. Yeah. Did you did it take much convincing when you had to speak to Sega in terms of getting the license in and pitching mm. the idea to them? Did, were they on board with it straight away, or did they take a bit of convincing as to what you were trying to do, or what was what was their reaction really? I've I've um, had active discussions with, uh, and I've said this to a, a few other sort of YouTubers. Um, if you was to take the five biggest games companies. Uh, in history so obviously we've got the big players now of Sony and Microsoft and Nintendo and that's pretty much it but if you look over the past from when video games consoles started mm-hmm. I've had discussions with a number of them um, everyone that I've had a discussion with has been positive and really liked the idea I've had no one turn around and say mm, uh, you know not too sure about that um, which is good uh, yeah that's really you know good. yeah um, at the same time, uh, I think the the success of the NES Mini probably helped with that attitude a little bit. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, they've they've been uh, all been quite positive with it, and Sega have been great so far. That's good. Um, that's yeah. really good. Yeah, yeah, no, that's great to hear. Um, I think I think a lot of these co- companies are quite sort of open to these kind of products uh, these days because you see Sega especially sort of you know licensing out quite a lot, don't you? And it's um, yeah, it's great to hear that they've been on board with it. Yeah. Well, the thing is, a lot of companies are really, especially these days, they're very protective about their licenses and stuff. So I think if yeah. they agree to license it to you, I think that's a sign that you're you're onto something, you're onto something good. Hmm. I like to think so. I mean, I, that was certainly the attitude I took when I when I got through the door with these people in the first place. Yeah. Hmm. Um, I mean, you know, some are much more protective than others. You know, Nintendo, uh, I, I imagine, um, are going to be a little bit more protective. Uh, yeah. Just notoriously yeah. so. Yeah, um, but I, I don't. There was a temptation early on to sort of just kind of, in the same way that you can buy model cars that are, are quite clearly a BMW three three series, but don't have the word BMW anywhere. Mm. There was there was a temptation early on to just sort of go, or oh, licensing is going to be really tricky. Maybe I should just you know do some reasonably cheap 
lookalikes, if you like. <laughs> Release um, a Bintendo 64 or something. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, and, and I was like, no, uh, it's that's not going to really, as I said, it's not going to light those... Um, memories of, from a no. nostalgia point of no, view, in my opinion. No, So yeah. we've made a rod for our own back in some respects by ensuring that every system's got to be licensed because, you know, for example, getting the license for the Commodore Amiga is going to be an absolute nightmare. We're already yeah. sort of, you know, looking into it, but Commodore Who and Amiga... Who even holds the license like, for that these days? Well, it's multiple people. Yeah. And, and so this is the problem. So Commodore is obviously owned by uh, one group. Amiga is owned by someone else. Um, and then that's disputed as well. Um, so some of them are a real issue. Um, mm. Even some something like the Spectrum um, is, you know, reasonably fine. But it's, people are often surprised when they you have to f- look back and find out who acquired it. Because obviously Amstrad bought Sinclair, uh, yeah. you know, well towards the end of its life. But obviously Am- Amstrad's uh, set-top box division then got bought by Sky. So trying to actually track down who owns the licenses to various things can be a real pain. Mm. Yeah, um, and after their recent misadventures with licensing their brand out, I think they're going to be a bit more cautious bit more, as well, yeah. aren't they? Yeah, totally. Um, and then you get things like the Vectrex, which, um, as I said, I'm, I'm currently looking at at the moment, which actually uh, revert back to the original inventor, uh, oh. uh, uh, Mr. No. Jay Smith. So, um, yeah... Uh, you know, in some respects, that's quite good because you're not dealing with a big, big company and, and you know all yeah. the hassles that come with that. But at the same time, you're trying to you know pin one person down to 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 a negotiation. Mm. Um, mm. So yeah, we'll try our best. Um, as I, I I think as I said, going back to Funko again, which I don't want to sort of you know labour the point too much, but I guess what's happened with Funko now is that people are knocking on their door, saying we want. Uh, uh, a Funko of uh, a pop vinyl of one of our licenses. So it's yeah. now the, the tables have turned a little bit and I'd like mm. to think that if we can get maybe 10 or 11 systems out, we'll get to the point where people are actually saying, well, why haven't you done a model of ours yet? Mm. Um, you know, and, and, and switch it around a little bit. Yeah. yeah, that'd be brilliant. That'd be awesome, yeah, yeah. I think uh, the obvious question is, um, I don't know if you can even tell us, but what <laughs> what, 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 are you, what are you thinking of next? Yeah, no, I can't tell you. Sorry. No. <laughs> I thought you couldn't. Um, yeah, no, as I said, we, uh, we're we sort of ready to go um, from a business perspective and a planning perspective. Mm. Um, we are in talks, as I said. Obviously, our relationship with Sega is really good at the moment. Um, so there is definitely a second model planned. Um, the the, the biggest the reality of the situation is it's a, a small business um and it takes a surprising amount of money to actually get something mass produced out onto the market in the way that we have yeah um so we're really sort of relying on the mega drive one actually doing you know well enough to sort of you know kick start the uh, finances for the for the next one to be mm. perfectly frank um so yeah that's the thing that's well, I'm quite happy to come on the podcast with you guys, and um, yeah, we're just you know trying to get this one sold. If this yeah. one doesn't sell enough, then it's going to make it much more difficult to get the next model out. Yeah. Um, if anything, it will just mean it takes longer to get the next model out, um, and I don't want to leave it too long, really. So, did I see you say on Twitter that you were planning to or thinking of releasing um, individual little cartridges for the Mega Drive that you could print your own labels for? Um, not not specifically that's something that we've we've we would quite like to do like a collection of cartridges mm. um almost in their own right like a you know like the lego minifigs yeah you know yeah. where you get like mm. a you know the, the shinobi trilogy and the shining force trilogy etc as a as yeah, a little brilliant. collection of cartridges yeah. so that's something we'd really like to do um yeah, but we'll just have good. to see yeah um mm. you know as i said they, people can then either collect them as part of the the main models themselves or or just you know, not worry about the main models and just enjoy collecting little miniature cartridges yeah. or yeah. discs or whatever. Um, yeah, it's, so it's it's something we're looking into, but um, yeah, we'll have to wait and see. Yeah, I mean, do with blind bags, little bags. <laughs> Open them up, four or five cartridges in there, It'd be amazing. Yeah, yeah, we That's thought about the blind idea, bag yeah. thing until I realised just how bloody annoying they are for my daughter. To <laughs> so, um, <laughs> it, you know, it's. Uh, <laughs> I think it's quite good for kids because they don't they just immediately assume if they get one that they've already got that their parents will just buy them another one at some point yeah. anyway but I imagine for us uh, 
<laughs> for people at my age, I'll just be really, really annoyed if I get the Sonic cartridge four times in a row. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we haven't really talked much about the cartridge itself, but it's a great, I mean, it's a great idea. It works really, really well. I'm, I'm sort of taking it out and plugging it in as we talk, as we speak, you know, and it's, it's, I, I love it. I love it. I just, I love the size of it. You know, um, it, it's, it's still bigger than a, a switch cartridge, by the way, if you, if you have, if you don't have one. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, it's just a great idea. It really sort of adds a lot to the to the product. I think you know, it's the thing that we when we as I said we when we do these sort of um, various markets and shows. That's the thing that we like to demonstrate to people the most. We will give them the cartridge yeah. and let them put it in, and it really does sell the sell the idea. I can imagine um, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it sounds like such a silly little thing, doesn't it? But um, that's what it's all about, really. It's just about. Mm. Um, firing off those new ones in the back of your mind of what it was like actually plugging the cartridge in um and if we hadn't done that it, i just don't think it would have had the same the same effect yeah, yeah the biggest problem we have from a as, as being an internet based retailer is trying to get that over to people that tactile mm. kind of feeling is a really good selling point but you just it's very difficult to get it over on you know, over the internet, which is why we're trying to do a lot of these various trade markets and what have you. Yeah, I saw um, you doing those. Did um, I guess? I guess you had quite a lot, of, a lot of interest from that. A lot of people coming up and having a look. Yeah, yeah, Lo- yeah. loads of people taking photos and stuff. And um, you know, it's I've, I've, the other thing as well. Even if you've just ignored the cartridge mechanism, going back to what you're saying before about making it as detailed as we have, mm. when we take photographs of it and we stick it on the website, a lot of people just think well it's a mega drive (laughs) we've actually designed it too deep too accurate in some respects and it doesn't you don't immediately see no uh, you need the scale scale yeah 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 um so that's why you know as i said we've done some photos with like an original sonic cartridge and you know an apple anything Mm. just to give it a bit of scale yeah Um, i think when when they kind of came up with the uh, the nes mini that holding it in your hand was quite a good good way of doing it as well yes that kind of gives you a good perspective doesn't it yeah i think you're right yeah we're we're Mm. probably going to try and do a few more um sort of like twitter videos and a few more photos actually in the hand yeah Uh, they they seem to garner quite a good response yeah um so yeah but the other thing we want to do is we want to try and get people to sort of uh, uh promote like modifying them and being a bit more sort of adventurous with with what you do with them like sticking in like 3d picture frames that kind of thing or Mm. obviously we've had someone stick a raspberry pi in one already yeah and um, with the working cartridge as well yeah that's yeah. amazing it's um, incredible that's incredible what people can do and it? it's just yeah using the rfid chips put it in the cartridge and uh and it loads the game up so it's all yeah clever stuff yeah very good very good um well i don't know i don't know if tibbs you want to uh, have any more any more questions for vic or no no i think i've covered the, the questions i had i mean I, I, like i say i think I was really interested to see how receptive Sega were to the idea, um, mm. and you know, it seems, you know, that they were, re- you know, they were on board with it, sort of pretty much straight away. So, I don't know. I, I do, it's just good to hear because I think sometimes people get the impression that sort of game companies and gamers are sort of separated by this sort of wide gulf and you know one's all profit driven and the other ones you know we just want to play the games and and it's nice to see that you know both sides can you know really appreciate and be on on the same page with you know a project like this it's really it's really nice yeah um i mean they have to build up a a slight wall um it's really funny when you first start with something like this and you think right i need to speak to people about licensing it's you can't believe how difficult it is to even try and get the correct contacts yeah. at mm. big games companies to even start that conversation because of course they're they're a consumer facing business and uh, not to do a discredit to to gamers or whatever but obviously they're quite demanding there's a lot of gamers that are quite young it's not like you can bang a telephone number on your website and pl- and say just please give us a call about anything you like <laughs> so you know yeah. they tend to obscure a lot of their um, sort of internal departments behind uh, you know contact forms on websites because they don't want mm. people complaining about the fact that a certain games crashed on their pc yeah um, yeah you know so they have to build up that barrier but once you get behind that um yeah no absolutely they're they're, they're passionate about what they do mm. um for the most part yeah. yeah yeah that's awesome i mean i love it i'd i'd um i'd like to think that even if the business um you know we had 30 or 40 models and it was you know it was incredibly busy pushing out new systems all the time and what have you um i like to think that i would continue to sort of do this kind of thing with people because 
been a game in my whole life. Once you actually get into the retro gaming sort of sub sub community, if you like, mm. everyone's been so so cool, really friendly, really helpful. All the people that do podcasts and YouTubers and stuff, everyone helps each other out. Yeah, um, and it's just been you know really 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 nice. Um, you know, g- gaming gets a lot of bad rep for being toxic and you know people that just want to shoot each other and violence in video games and all this sort of stuff and that might be true up to a point with the wider gaming community possibly but the the retro gaming side's been lovely um Mm. uh, you know if all else and i I hope this the business does take off because obviously i've got a lot of money riding on it (laughs) (laughs) Uh, but uh in in 15 years time i could always look back and say well you know that was a really decent bunch of people that i um that i met and uh, were willing to help out yeah well it's based on so much love isn't it the retro community i mean it's all based on things that you know it's not just you know bitching about the the current current games or the current climate of whatever it's about talking about the things that you love from your childhood you know you don't focus on the bad things you focus on the good things and everyone kind of shares in that really don't they absolutely so and that's what your product's all about really so yeah hope so yeah yeah brilliant okay Thank you very much for that. That was really, really interesting. Thank you. No, no problem at all. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, we're going to take a quick uh, break now, uh, and then when we come back, we're going to, you've uh, picked a book club pick for us as well, haven't you? <laughs> yes. Very <laughs> interested in this one. Keeping in with the theme of our, our shows. Um, so, yeah, we're going to talk about that in a minute, so we'll see you in a sec. Welcome back to Bottom Up. Um, yeah, as I was just saying to you uh, in the break, brilliant chat with uh, with you, Vic, uh, about the, the model. Uh, we wish you all the best with it. It's it's really cool. Thank I can't you. Can't wait to Appreciate see it. what you're going to come with, come up with next. Um, what, what's your your website if, if anyone wants to uh, log retro on? Electromodels dot com. Okay, and the um, Mega Drive is thirty four ninety nine. Is that right? Yep. Yep. Okay, so get on We've it. Just started doing free postage as well. Ah, brilliant. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's one of the, you know, it's one of those things, isn't it, where you start to you look at the analytics and you think is uh, is the postage the thing that stops people finishing off in the shopping cart or what have you? Um, yeah. So we thought we'd make things a bit simpler and um, okay, and just Very good. start offering free postage. Very good, and it's limited to two thousand units. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. Okay, so get on it, people. Get on it. It's it's a great model. Honestly, you've got to get on it. So, um, we do a book club pick every month, and we normally take it in turns. Uh, this time, as the guest, you've picked uh, the book club uh, pick for this month. Uh, do you want to tell yes. the people what it is? <laughs> right, so, um, I think the correct naming, as you discussed on your last yeah. podcast, is Herzog's Vi. Yeah. Uh, but um, as a 14-year-old who didn't speak any German, uh, and still don't, uh, I used to call it Herzog's Wii. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> my mates uh, that I used to play it with used to call it Herzog's Wii. Yeah. Um, so it's not going to be called anything other than Herzog's Wii for the rest of this podcast. <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> um, saying Herzog's Vire, just apart from the fact that it makes, it makes me sound like I'm an extra on Hello Hello, um, <laughs> it just doesn't sound right. So um, No, I can yeah. totally see that, yeah. It's funny because I looked up a few like YouTube videos on it and every single one of them was saying Herzog's Wii or Herzog's Way or something like that. And yeah. no one said Zvi. <laughs> it's funny. No. Um have we all we've all played Final Fantasy Seven here? Have we at some point? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Cat Sith. Mm. Apparently, the the proper pronunciation of Cat Sith is Cat Chi. But really, I just can't get my head around it. No. You, I, it, it. I just it never sounds right to me. So just because it's the yeah. 
technically correct pronunciation. You know, I'm always going to call him Cat Seth. You know, it's just Absolutely. one of those things, isn't it? Was his name yeah. spelt like C A T or was it C A I T? I thought it was C A I T. Yeah, C A I T S I T H. I was just calling him Kate Seth. It's not something that I ever said out loud. No. Yes, I think I was the only person that ever played Final Fantasy VII amongst my group of friends. Um, so it wasn't like I'd sort of uh, walk up to them the next the next day and go, "Oh, well, you, uh, you know, have you levelled up, Kate, Kate <laughs> Seth?" Yeah. So, um, but in my mind, I, I think it was probably yeah, it flitted between Cat and Kate. Yeah. yeah. So um, Herzog's Wii is um, is a, a real time strategy game. It's kind of the, yeah. the first one. In a sense. Yeah. Is that kind of right? Yeah. Is yeah, it? it really is. I'm, um, I mean, I'm sure, as with anything that's labelled the first, you could find yeah. um, examples of components that built, you know, got mm. that s- sort of uh, genre to where it is. But I think it's widely considered to be the first R- RTS that has the, the most common elements of what make the genre the genre, mm. which is deployable units, units that you can control, um, you know, either via command or directly and bases mm. um, and I'm, yeah, as I said I'm not sure there's a game that ticks those boxes before Herzog's Wii yeah it's surprising that it was on the, the me- and just an early Mega Drive game as well where it was sort of surrounded by kind of arcade ports and very kind yeah. of arcade games you've yeah. got this kind yeah. of thing that's that's more suited to a PC generally that we think of yeah, um, it's interesting. Yeah, but and it, was, it is a sequel, as you, you mentioned yeah. on the on the podcast that um, there yeah. was a, a Herzog, mm. which I think came out on the MSX and yeah, the, um, yeah, Shark I did look X that one. up after the podcast. Yeah, there was an um, original. Yes, yeah. that's right. Yeah, um, again, doesn't actually really follow the criteria of being the, uh, an RTS in the same way as Zwei does, because um, you can actually individually control the units. So what you basically did is you controlled the robot similar to this one, but you just built the units and they just helped you in battle. Um, okay. So this was the first one where you could actually issue them commands. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, no, I, I got it originally on the Mega Drive when I was 14 years old. Mm. Um, I I had an import Mega Drive. So um, mine was a Japanese import before. I think the Mega Drive had only just come out when uh, Herzog's Wii was released. Um, so mine was a Japanese import. So... If you imagine how complicated that game was to figure out how to play <laughs> now, <laughs> we'll, we will YouTube get into videos, this, yeah. how long do you think it took me to figure it out with a Japanese instruction oh my manual? God. Yeah, God, uh, I don't know yeah, how. You... So me, and, me and my mate spent a good three or four evenings uh, trying to figure it out. But yeah. that's what you did. You've spent oh, forty yeah. quid on a game. Of course, you're as not a gonna... teenager. You're not. You're, <laughs> you're not going to discard it, especially if you've just imported it. You know, and it's not like these days where you play a ROM and if you can't figure it out within five seconds, you play yeah. another one. It's yeah, that was a different time. Uh, yeah. yeah, but I mean, some of the stats. I mean, so it's developed by Technosoft and published by Sega. Um, first released yep. in December 1989 in Japan, and then April 1990 in America, and some point in 1990 here. Um, and yeah, it's an early Mega Drive game. These days, it's around for a box one, it's around 25, 30 quid. So not mm. too bad, but a little bit kind kind of expensive fish. Um, and a loose cart is about 10 to 20 quid, but not too bad. Um, yeah, it's um, as you say, Herzog's Vi means uh, Duke Two in German, apparently. Oh, Duke. I Duke. see. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So you got it, uh, you got the Japanese version. I mean, uh, what um, what kind of drew you to, to getting it? Um, uh, just a lack of choice. <laughs> okay, fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> <laughs> it was, you know, back in the, uh, uh, as I said, I don't know how old you guys are. I've just turned 44. Um, so, as I said, I was a teenager when, when the Mega Drive um, sort of got announced in Japan. Absolutely mm. wanted one. I had a master system before that, um, and it. Although you could get lots of games in the mail order, so you'd look in the back of computer and video games, and it'd be uh, you know your typical mail order ad with about fifty or sixty import games. Obviously, that's just a line of text. It mm. doesn't give you anything to go on, and if you're going to be spending good import money on a game, unless computer and video games or me machines actually reviewed it, you you weren't going to take a chance. Um, Herzog's Wii was one of the games that we you could actually see in the shop uh right. there used to be a shop called shikana computers in Tottenham court road in london that used to have a lot of the um, import stuff on display um so you know took a look at it 
Uh, already had Thunder Force 2, which was also made by Technosoft. That was mm. one of the first games I got for the Mega Drive. So, yep. um, yeah, no, I thought it, it looked good. But as I said, trying to figure it out was an absolute nightmare. Mm. Um, once we did figure it out, because I often just you know, played games with my best mate at the time, um, the reason I recommended it is that once we got over that hurdle and actually played it multiplayer, it was just one of the best multiplayer games at the time that we'd ever played. Yeah, I can see um, that. Yeah. You know, as I said, this was before Street Fighter as well. Mm. So, uh, and before Mario Kart, I believe. Um, so when you think about it, you know, what other two-player games did people play on games consoles? Mm. Um and this game was just like absolutely mind blowing from that perspective. There was a real sort of combat competitiveness to it, playing it multiplayer. It's not quite as good playing against a computer. And no. that was my only concern no. when recommending it to you guys was that, you know, um we'd potentially be missing out on the best element of this, which is yeah. the the multiplayer side. I definitely got that element came across definitely because I mean the it's the playing against computer is interesting, but I think I mean I was looking at sort of strategies on YouTube as well and uh, a lot of the times you could um, we'll get into more details of the game in a minute but uh, there was one person just t basically taking like a, even a, like a soldier or a, a, a tank or something going to the far corner just behind the enemy base dropping him off uh, sh shooting the base letting, letting that shoot the base and then just sort of defending it and then just kind of like <laughs> and let, like you know kind of ignoring all the other kind of uh, aspects of it because the AI was too dumb to kind of yeah. go into that corner and defend itself. <laughs> yeah, kind of I don't want to put my basically. programming hat on too much, but um, by far the most difficult thing with writing a game like that is the AI. Oh yeah, definitely. And, definitely. That, and how you're yeah. limited to just uh, uh, the, the um, uh, navigation of units is is difficult in itself. Yeah. I mean, there's certain algorithms that you can write that are known algorithms. Like, I can't remember. It's called like Aparvin or something. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the AI was always going to be a weak point. Mm. Fortunately, at the time, there was no internet, so we didn't. Uh, yeah. You couldn't. Yeah, yeah. You <laughs> couldn't, couldn't see couldn't that. Couldn't look so up the way of just... cheesing the system. Like, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. In that in that particular way, and, and I still haven't. So uh, thanks for ruining that for oh, me. Sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> it kind of ruined it for me as well when I saw it. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. a bit like when the first time you find out that in um, was it Afterburner on the Master System, you could basically just hold in the hold the plane in the top left hand corner, <laughs> and yeah. not get shot down. <laughs> Well, like um, we mentioned on our previous uh, podcast, the um, Duck Hunt and the old Light Gun games, if you just pointed the gun at a light bulb, it would <laughs> yeah. get yeah. that accuracy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, no, it's definitely a, uh, it's a, it's a really good multiplayer game. And I, no, Damien Mc, um, McFarren on Twitter the other day, um, I think I tagged you guys in yes, on it, Yes, you did, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. He, he mentioned it purely off the cuff that it's you know, one of the best multiplayer games out there. Mm. Um, mm. So I think maybe what we should do um, at some point is perhaps try and uh, retro-arch the emulator now yeah. has uh, network multiplayer It does, no, capabilities. Yeah, yeah. It does, yeah. Which I imagine are a bit of a pain in the ass to get up and running, but it might be, will be worth it for this game, just, yeah. just to experience it in that way. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, I mean, you'd, you'd cream us, I think. I mean, I, I, I think... Cause I we think said it'd be last less time. trouble to set up than this Skype conversation. <laughs> Probably, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you say as I said, I, I revisited it purely because uh, because I've mentioned it on the podcast, and I hadn't played it for a good long time myself. Mm. But largely because I just forgotten what all of the commands did, and I couldn't be bothered yeah. to learn them again. Yeah, yeah. Um, but just yesterday was the first time I finally got around to beating the computer without any of your cheats, as you've just mentioned. Oh uh, right, no, um, I, I, just, I didn't manage that at all in my in my, <laughs> in my time it's, limits, it, No, it's kind of just. Um, I think there's a there's a speed element, isn't there, to trying to get as many of the bases taken yeah, over the that's it. That's, menu that's what I, first. I find with these because um, with real time strategy games, I, I find myself under a lot of pressure to get everything kind of right, and you've got to be across so many different things. Okay, I need to defend my base, but I also need to start occupying other bases, and got to think about their base, and it, it, it kind of a brain melt at the beginning where you're not really sure what to do at first. I've, I yep. find that not being very good at RTSs at all. Um, yeah. So we should let's run over some of the rules because it is a complicated game, um, and I've got like some notes here to make sure I don't miss anything. So basically, the object is to destroy your opponent's base, um, and you you take control of a, a sort of a shoot 'em up style uh, ship that can roam freely around uh, this terrain in a top down perspective. Um, so the ship uh, runs out of fuel quickly, um, and when it does, or you get shot down, you're transported back to your base with a short time penalty. 
Um, it can also transform into a rather cool uh, but slower paced uh, mech to participate in ground based attacks and to conserve energy. Um, you cannot directly attack the enemy base. Um, to do that, you need to construct various forces and strategize an attack. Um, so, uh, that's my dog. Sorry. <laughs> oh my god, that was really weird. I thought, what the hell is that? <laughs> That's so weird. Dream. Well, that's that's the clip. That's the opening clip for the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> that was really bizarre. Do you know what? It's it's... Not, I don't think he's ever done that before in his entire life. But because I'm just um, I'm doing a podcast, I decided. <laughs> that was so bizarre. That sounded like a ghost or something. In fact, it sounded a bit like Tibbs, and I thought he was going a bit nuts. <laughs> Oh, bless him. Oh, my God. What's your dog's so let's name? let's talk about Herzog's Wee. What's your dog's name? Marley. Oh, good boy, Marley. Good boy. What a surprise. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Sorry about that. That's all right. No, don't worry. That's <laughs> scared the bejesus out of me, but that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> that's never happened oh, yeah. on the show before. <laughs> okay. So, um, where was <laughs> so uh, yeah, via a menu, you can order various types of units. Um, and you can pick them up from your your uh, home base and distribute them where you please. Uh, so yeah. unfortunately, the units and the instructions that you can give them are given various code names um, rather than sort of sensible names for the most part. I have, I have no idea why they did that, but yep. Yeah, it's, it's really uh, weird, isn't it? Like you you need a, a manual or a, a crib suit or something to to know how to what each thing is. And I mean, yeah. it seems to me I'm, maybe they're they're sort of well known military terms. I don't know. I'm not very okay with that but yeah it seemed a bit bizarre um so you need like a yeah you need like a little guide or figuring out through trial and error as you did in japanese uh, to be fair i mean i don't know how you found it but um you do pick up the main ones you do you do definitely <laughs> pretty quickly actually yeah. they become blind and obvious at some point and then you go well <laughs> yeah. that's obviously attack the base and that's obviously go into a base yes that. yeah true um, yeah i mean i yeah. i managed to find um i've got uh, retro gamer did a um like a, a uh, what's the word? A, um, a compilation of uh, they got a Mega Drive and a SNES book, and they got a compilation of their articles. And I managed to fi- dig it out and find the Herzog's Vi in here, and it's got a complete oh, right. kind of list of, of. I put it on Twitter actually. It's got a complete list of all the uh, the units and the the uh, the kind of the programs you can give them, uh, which yeah, is very useful. Yeah. Which is extremely <clears throat> helpful because <laughs> you can look it up. But I mean, there's not actually that many kind of guides I found because I was looking on the internet. I couldn't find anything like that kind of like this image goes with this kind of thing, and this is what they do. So mm. I'll, I'll run through a few of them. So you can you basically you have to you go through a menu and you order kind of these these units to appear. You go and pick them up. Uh, you can get an infantry, um, which are essential for occupying other kind of smaller bases throughout the terrain, aren't they? So the, the I think the main purpose of that is to get more money. Is that right? Or money coming in at a more frequent amount? Frequent, right? Yeah. 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 So you've got a, you've got a, a sort of a limitless amount of money in that it keeps topping up. But to occupy more bases by sending out, I think it was four uh, infantry soldiers to to um, occupy the base. By doing that, you'll get money coming in more frequently, so you can spend it on more units. Yeah. Um, so you've got um, an FWA, which is a motorcycle scout, obviously. Um, uh, an Arm 51D, which is an armoured car. A Tax 52, which is a tank. A Sam 42, which is a surface-to-air unit. Um, that's designed specifically to take out the, the enemy commander's plane. Um, and then you've got a GMR 34A, which is a gun emplacement. An ST-57U. I don't... Really wouldn't know why I started reading out all these, but I can carry on anyway. And that's a boat. And then you've got there's a supply. Not many, is there? so. No, there's not too many. There's a supply <coughs> truck. I never actually use a supply truck. Is that um, that uh, rear- says rearms your troops? Are they yes. run out? Of, they run out of ammo. They do then? eventually. They, they, a little speech bubble pops up next to them with an exclamation mark inside, which basically means they run out of ammo. Okay. Um, and right. the supply truck will, if it's not falling off the edge of a cliff and getting stuck somewhere. Yeah, um, yeah, it happens a lot. <laughs> that's that's there, a yeah. very annoying part. Yeah, and yeah, it's, it's a shame up. on the first map. It's p- more pr- prevalent on the, the the first map that you would select. Yeah, I didn't it's really quite a few little canyons. Yeah, I did try a few others, but I mainly stuck to that first map. Map, and it was um, yeah, it was kind of an annoying feature. And then you yeah. can program each of those with various things. So you can program them to sort of stay still and only attack when something comes nearby. You can tell them to patrol. 
um, approach a base and stay there, kind of. There. And then you can occup- you tell them to go and occupy the nearest small base, um, pursue other uh, enemies, and then uh, the big one was uh, sort of go and attack the base, basically. Mm. So, I mean, you've basically while this is going on, you've got your opponent flying around, uh, doing the same thing as you. He's going, and as I, as I said before, you. You're kind of, well, you start off and you hear all these sound effects going on and it's, it's the opponent uh, uh, kind of prepare, making all these preparations and you're like, oh god, I've got, to, I've got to get going and get moving. And he's basically going around to all the other bases and trying to occupy them, setting up his own defences. Um, and yeah, then you've got to kind of do the same really. Um, and yeah, basically, basically just making sure you've got the balance between arming your bases and sending out tanks and stuff to to try and slowly whittle down the health bar of the of the base. So, yep. Vic, I don't know if you want to add what your your sort of usual strategy is to this because I went <laughs> through a few different ones and they all kind of failed. <laughs> um, well, I don't think it's anything particularly uh, clever. I think there's an element of um, dexterity there, uh, mm. as I suppose even with modern RTS games, mm. um, the the men units build really quickly. And it's worth noting that you don't have to be on top of a base to actually set off a build, like an order to do a build. Yeah, it took me a while to you can actually, find that yeah, out. Yeah, so you can set it off <laughs> while you're coming back from one of the other bases, so it's yeah. ready to be collected when you actually get back to your home base. That's right. Um, yeah. the, the tactic that seems to work for me is to actually uh, try and take one or two of the more centre bases first. So right. rather than going for the obvious ones which are nearest to you, mm. um, you know he's unlikely to take those off of you because they're quite closest to your home base but if you take the ones near the middle of the map um first and at least just get one or two tanks around them yeah it allows you a bit more breathing space to then take the other ones you know that are nearest your base without too much trouble okay um so i think that's the tactic i tend to use mm. um it's then just about putting a number of tanks around the bases which the way that the the ai obviously works which you know, you could you could argue that it's not particularly clever, but I suppose when you think about it, it has to do one of these things. It it will start to just pick on one base. Right. It's either one that you haven't taken, or it's one that you have taken. Mm. And um, once you know that it's picking on that one base, that's the one that you stick a lot of units at. And then it's just kind of that that juggling between making sure there's enough units around that base to stop him from taking it, and at the same time just trying to get a few units uh, to attack his main base or to try and take one of the other bases yeah. and it's juggling those two things and then at some point what you'll notice is he'll give up on that particular base if he can't take it and then start on one of the others mm. and that's kind of how it works and it's just, it is just a battle of attrition yeah. um, but that's really why I, I totally take your point with RTS games that if you play one with a mouse and keyboard and, and there's no um you are the the commander, if you like, as opposed to a character on screen. Mm. You, there is sometimes quite a lot going on, and the reason I like this one so much, and I think it was considering it is one of the first or the first, and it's such a masterstroke, is the fact that your your commander is a character in the game. Yeah, there's an interesting um, twist that you know, I haven't seen that yeah. in any anything. I it, they did it in Total Annihilation on okay. the PC, All right. which was actually <clears> a really good <throat> RTS game. Mm. Um, and it, it, that came out shortly after Red Alert, I think, mm. and and did try to do something different. And it's interesting, you know, people thought that that was unique to that game, <laughs> didn't realise that it had actually been done already. Yeah. Um, but, you know, having that ship means that you can see exactly what the other enemy's doing, um, which means I don't find it quite so stressful because it's you've got that kind of uh, focus on where your ship is and where their ship is. Yes, um, yeah. So, yeah, no, I, I like it from that perspective. And I think it's really, it's a, what amazes me from someone that's always been a fan of game design and, you know, written my own sort of little games myself over mm. the years, is that there are so many um, design choices within that game that are absolutely the best design choice. And if you was to do it a different way, the whole thing wouldn't have worked quite as well as it does. Yeah. So, for example, and other RTSs have done this, the, the idea that you have to put four units into a base to take the base um, is brilliant. If they'd done it as just one unit, uh, you know, like an, an engineer would do in Command and Conquer Red Alert and it just takes the base over, um, that wouldn't have, I don't think it would have worked half, half as well mm. because you would have had this constant thing where he's putting his person in and taking it, then you're putting it in and taking it. 
and the fact that you have four units. Yeah. You know, when you think these guys were starting from scratch designing this game, there's never, they yeah. hadn't seen anything like it before, and that worked really well. Yeah. The fact that you can't destroy <coughs> their own their, their home base directly with your main ship. Yes. Mm. is again really good design choice yeah you, it if must have gone through that yeah it must have gone through so many iterations to kind of get these rules worked out because as you kind of play it you start to understand these rules and you, you realize what you can and can't do and you kind of think on their side they must have gone through the same process and they must have yeah. tried okay if we can attack the base that's no fun because we can just go and attack the base and just yeah. do none of that <clears> stuff so but even having energy on the plane so yeah. you can only fly that's so right, far yeah. from your base really clever yeah really forces the game down a particular mechanics route that you know otherwise you'd be flying all over the place yeah um the ability to transform really good mm -hmm. um uh, there's so many really clever design choices in that game yeah um and it's a it's it's it's, it's a shame that it's just criminally underlooked um yeah it might not be quite as much fun to play as i said this is what you're we're here to talk about and uh, and I'm not quite sure what your overall thoughts are of it but um, from a, a, a historic point of view and to appreciate what it achieved at the point when it came out I think it's um, it's it was well worth mentioning yeah definitely it's a very very interesting game I, I mean I, I'm not particularly an RTS fan I think especially at this at this time you know I've got a, a young family not a lot of time I prefer to play games that are just sort of, I don't have to think about too much, you know, I just have to yeah. react. <clears throat> so uh, I, it's a difficult one because I can totally appreciate all of these little things that have gone into it and, and exactly everything you've said. It's a, it is generally a very good game, but I don't know if it's one that I would eagerly play again just because I find it quite stressful <laughs> and there is yeah. a learning curve to it and I don't, I do kind of want to do it, and I don't kind of want to do it. I don't know. I mean, Tibbs, what were you, what were your thoughts on it? Did you have anything? I think the feeling with it is with me rather than the game. Yeah. Um, when I played it, I wanted because I know uh, Vic really helpfully sent us across um, a YouTube video that sort of explained it all and laid it all out. Yeah. I wanted to give it a try without that at first to try and because i hadn't played it before so it'd be i wanted to go into it as if i was playing it back in the day you know yeah. i didn't have any guides for it and i just wanted to experience it and i remember there's a game on the playstation and pc as well um an rts game called zed and it's about yep. these little sort of robots, robots that go about yeah. yeah and i remember playing the demo of that and just thinking i don't know what's going on i'm so bad at this <laughs> um and i got I, I had flashbacks of that when i was playing it, it was that same sort of thing where it's just really overwhelming <clears throat> but um, like zed it's it does kind of all click in and then when you see the um you know when you watch the tutorials and you read the uh, the guides on exactly what's happening and what you're supposed to be doing it really does click into place um i think I think I'd probably enjoy it more playing it multiplayer than against a PC, uh, against the um, computer. Yeah. yeah, I think um, I think that's what it's designed for. Isn't it? I can imagine. Like well, you're a, not under pressure either, then, are you? No. Yeah. Because no. if the other person's just as uh, rubbish as you exactly are, exactly at the outset, you've <laughs> yeah. both got a bit of breathing space. I mean, that that would completely change it for me. I think I didn't get to do to, to play it against another person, but I think yeah, playing it against someone else with your skill level. Yeah. Um, that that yeah exactly that's it, the thing. Yeah. I was, if you've got two people playing it and you're playing it together, you're both learning it together, you're both at an equal skill level. Yeah. I think it's one of those games that would become very quickly frustrating if there's a if there's mismatch skills. If one of yeah. you's really good at it, one of you's not very good at it, you're gonna have a you're gonna have a rough time with it. But <laughs> yeah. I think if you're going into it together and you're both learning it together, I think it'd be a tremendous amount of fun. Yeah, mm. I can totally see how much fun you would have had uh, at the time once once you and your, your friend got it clicked into place yeah. for you. Yeah, definitely. And of course, it's split screen as well. Yeah. So yeah. you're not really... It, it, it's not relying on you hiding each other's screens like a lot of, you know, obviously FPS multiplayer games do, mm. uh, and even modern-day RTS games. You tend to have like a fog of war or a shroud, depending on the type of game. And there's a lot of you're purposely not looking at what the other person's doing. Whereas on this one, it's like well, it's like a game of chess. Actually, you can mm. see what the other piece, people's pieces are in a game of chess, and it doesn't make it a lesser game. That's a really um, good analogy, actually. You know, yeah. you can see everything the other person's doing, and you just got to react to it. And That's they right, know you're yeah. going to react to it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I totally take your point. It's it's um, there is a learning curve. 
Mm. It definitely does click. And one thing I noticed going back to it after many years was, um, and I don't know if you you had this, but when I got into a bit of a high pressure situation like the, you know, I'm having a shooting match with the uh, enemy commander, mm. I would get the buttons mixed up. Yes. And I'd quite often want to transform and end up just flicking into the menu. I was constantly yeah. getting the buttons mixed up. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't matter how many times I played it, I still end up having a bit of a spaz moment every now and again where I'm just randomly loading up various screens. That's right. Well, it's that's the thing uh, that it adds to the stress, I, I found, because I, <laughs> I for some reason, I don't know why, because I'm usually quite good at it with my buttons, but I was just getting them mixed up all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you said I'm, that. As, again, I'm sure that comes with uh, comes with experience at yeah. some point. I don't ever remember having that problem when I played it back in the yeah. <laughs> I think one thing we've got to mention as well, and we I don't think we we've touched on yet, is how good that soundtrack is. Oh, it's it? brilliant, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it it's really sound- is. It's it's like that classic Mega Drive sound. Isn't yeah, it? yeah, it's very similar to the Thunder Force games, isn't it? Yeah, that, that, that soundtrack. I love those those soundtracks. Yeah, they're really. Uh, yeah, really I good. wouldn't be surprised if they've got the same composer actually. As I said, yeah. it's the same company. Yeah, um, but yeah, absolutely. Um, and the shooting elements. I mean, I've, I suppose the the only thing that I'd perhaps um, is a bit of a negative to it, apart from the single player thing we just mentioned is the fact that you've got um essentially a shooting you know airplane that doesn't tend to do a lot of shooting unless the other commander's in play yeah and con- considering their shoot em up heritage with the thunder force series mm. it would have been quite nice if there were some units that you perhaps could shoot mm. um, and bring more of the shoot em up element into it yeah um, just seemed like a bit of a wasted opportunity Yes, um, it's it's almost. I always thought, thought it was like a kind of a Trojan horse kind of game where it was kind of trying to sell itself as a shoot 'em up, but really, that was that was just the that was just the the basic part of it. You know, yeah. it, was, it wasn't really a shoot 'em up at all. And maybe that's what contributed to it not being a you know a huge uh, success and being. Cause I mean, at the same time, it's actually it's the best way of doing it. People have struggled to do RTS games on games consoles for mm. decades now yeah and you know even every, every especially during the xbox 360 and uh, ps3 generation there was always this thing of there's a new rts coming out and they finally cracked it on games consoles mm. and then it comes out like halo wars or there was that ubisoft one wasn't there um and they come out and inevitably they're like no it's actually a bit rubbish with the controller <laughs> you need a keyboard yeah. and mouse yeah and actually this yeah having the plane solves that problem straight away it does yeah because it's not trying to be a keyboard and mouse rts um so as i said i'll give it full credit for that as well that yeah. having the commander on the, the as far as a games console with a control pad it's the best way of doing an rts yeah you don't feel like it's cutting corners you just feel like well that's how it's been designed yeah, yeah you know definitely. commander's on screen and he picks up the units and drops them around yeah there is a very natural sense to that really isn't it and it just kind of it goes well with the, the mega drive as well that's that's how mega drive games are played you know you play as a as a character as an avatar and yeah. um you know it's just the difference is he's he's kind of commanding other things rather than you know doing things just for himself yeah. you know yeah it's a really good point actually mm. there was a remake um uh spiritual remake also made a few years ago um i can't remember the name of it it's on pc yeah um because i was just about to say it's one of those games that with a little bit of tweaking you could see that they're using modern sensibilities there's a there'd be a really really good game game to be had there yeah you know just gets rid of some of the clunkiness of the controls um when it's in robot form yeah you know improve the ai a little bit um but yeah what was the name of it i'll um see if i can remember the name i'll tweet it out yeah, no, that'd be really good to find out. Actually, I'd, I'd, yeah, I'd have a yeah. Look. I think it's called Air Force or something like that. But, okay. Uh, yeah. Um, it's. I, I was thinking it would make a great kind of um, almost like a co-op game, wouldn't it? If you had a co-op mode in it, and like two yeah. people, you know, one person looking after the base, another person kind of you know uh, attacking the other one, uh, you know, against an AI or against two other people, that would be quite good, wouldn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Yeah. But uh, yeah, we should definitely um, <coughs> we should try and get it up and running. Uh, multiplayer, <laughs> yeah. Definitely, Just so absolutely. at least you don't go away thinking that uh, you know it, it's not that great. Um, but I'm sure the multiplayer is great. Yeah, you should uh, give it a go. Yes, definitely. It was because um, last time we did uh, Toe Jam and Earl, and there was a sense from that that the multiplayer was the, especially what other people said about it, the multiplayer was <coughs> really where it was at with that game. And I think it's, it's definitely the same here, probably even more so in here. So yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I've been meaning to kind of look into that net play on the on retroarch because it seems like really it seems really good. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. I can. I think you've got to get the right, exactly the same ROMs. I have difficulty to, trying to do that. Uh, the sequel, the spiritual successor, was that Air Mech Arena? Does that sound That's like the, the one. right one? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Air Mech. Yeah. That's the one. Uh, that was free to play for a while, actually. I think when it was in an um, early release form, so I had a yeah. brief, brief go of it. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Xbox Three Sixty and PC. Oh, okay. Interesting. Yeah. I have yeah, to look into that. One. Good. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Um, anything else to say about this this game? No, I, I'd say anyone listening should give it a try. Definitely, definitely um, yeah. if you've got the ability to do it to to do it multiplayer, then that, that's definitely the way to go. I think. Yeah, yeah. it looks like it. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. would say, and I, I would say the same to you too, is that persevere if you can until the point when you beat the computer once. Yeah. Because the payoff <laughs> once you've beaten him, that stress level drops, and uh, and everything suddenly goes. It was worth it. Yeah, uh, yeah. And you, the game then takes on a different appeal once you've beaten it the, just that first time um, without doing any of the tricks. As I said, it actually isn't that difficult. It's just it's a, it's a speed thing and just constantly looking at the radar to see where yeah. he's going and just trying to cut him off. Yeah, yeah. I got kind of close at one point. Um, so yeah, it's definitely possible. I think with a couple more goes, I reckon I could I could get a strategy down. Well, I think I think Vic, I think it's what you said earlier. It's, it's about the dexterity and 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 the speed of what you're doing and keeping keeping yeah. just keeping mindful of everything that's going on. That's the key to it, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. But I totally take your point about just um, <laughs> games just being quite stressful now uh, <laughs> a lot of the time. They're either one of two things, aren't they? Either they require too much brain matter, which after you've done a day's work. Yeah. Uh, and everything else is going on, you just don't want to invest, or they're three hundred hours long. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. You know, and yeah. and I think that's one of the big problems with AAA games now is that they've almost all just followed this template of like they call it like the Ubisoft template, but it's actually the Grand Theft Auto template as much mm. as anything. Of mm. we're going to give you this massive world, and we're going to give you five hundred things to collect and a different five hundred things to collect <laughs> as well, mm. and all of these things to hunt and all of these things to build. And if you're a little bit OCD, which I think a lot of gamers are, that I find that quite stressful. Because I hate the fact that all of these things are in the game and I'm not going to do yeah. them. Yeah, and the, yeah. And the main missions tend <laughs> to take a side sort of side uh, course because you're too busy trying to do all these other little collecting things. That's right. Um, yeah. And ultimately, it just ends up putting you off AAA games because you just, I can't be bothered to spend 300 hours playing a game. Yeah. That's exactly good I think value it was for money, Assassin's but... Creed that broke me on that one with the, all the feathers and the, the flags yeah. and stuff, you know, I just. Oh, too much. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's exactly what puts me off AAA. I don't play them very often anymore, just because I don't. I really don't have the time, you know. And like Spider Man, for instance, is I think it's got a good single player campaign. It's got a lot of other stuff to find in there, and I'm just like, I'm never going to get around to all that. It's just, yeah, you know, you know, I don't want to spend like months because that's what it will take me to do it. Months playing one game, I'd rather just play, you know, lots of little smaller games and just kind of keep it self contained. You know? Yeah, I think Crackdown on the 360 had it right, where it was just like there's orbs. Mm. that's the only collecting thing and the orbs have a tangible effect on your character because they basically level him up mm. um, and I was fine with that but as I said when you play like, some of the Far Cry games so as you said uh, oh, yeah, Terry Cry, the, yeah. uh, the last Assassin's Creed I got was the um, Origins one was it the, the one in Egypt um, oh yeah 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 I never played it but yeah the, the, yeah, I think that was Origins wasn't it yeah, mm. and I realised that I'd probably spent 20 hours on it and only done two of the main missions because I spent half the time <laughs> following dots on a bloody radar. Um, and then I made a conscious decision, which I think is actually quite a good one, which was to um, head for the main missions on the map and only do the submissions that you're, that cross your path. Mm. So ignore yeah. all the other ones on the map yeah. and you know, just don't, don't go out of your way to go to these other missions, but just go for the ones that are on your way to the main mission. Mm. Um and that was much better, but obviously by that point I'd sort of uh, lost all my goodwill by grinding for most of it. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. Um, so should we wrap this one up? Then it's getting late now. So uh, yeah, is everyone happy? Yeah, I'm very happy. Cool. Yeah, thanks Excellent. for having us on. No, brilliant. Uh, there's one matter left though, isn't there, to pick the the game that Tibbs and I will be playing next month. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, that's going to be my choice. Is it? <laughs> it is. It is. That's fine. Finally. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, this one we're going to. There we go. Hang on. So um, 
uh, we're going to play uh, the sequel to a classic game from my childhood, a classic handheld game from my childhood. The game that we're going to be playing is on the Game Boy. It's going to be Super Mario Land 2, Six Golden Coins. Oh, Ooh. awesome. Yeah. I, I loved, I never played, well, I played this a little bit in emulation, but I never played it much uh, as a kid. Um, but I played the, the the first one to death. I think um, I think if you like me, if you had like the combination of Mega Drive and Game Boy, yeah, this was your Mario. Do you know what I mean? Like it, you didn't if you didn't have access to the NES, you didn't have access to the SNES. Absolutely, you know, this was your only. <laughs> a lot of Americans don't quite understand this, I think. But you know, you th- this was my idea of Mario. So when people say, whenever people say the classic Mario theme, you know, I, I you know I think. To me, that's not it. It's the it's the music from Mario Land, you know. Exactly the same situation yeah. for me, yep. yeah. Had a yeah. Game Boy and a Mega Drive. Yeah. Did get a SNES eventually. Yeah. But uh, you know, and it's the only Mario I ever finished. Yeah. <laughs> Don't yeah, do complete one. any of the others. Yeah, so, no, the 2D yeah. ones are uh, rock, aren't they? Um, but yeah, so we're going to be... I've always been curious about the second one. I think it's it's quite a weird kind of Mario, isn't it? It's a bit like Mario Brothers 2 on the NES, and it's quite different. You know, so I'll be intrigued. Yeah. Which wasn't yeah. originally a Mario game. No, that's it? right. Yeah, no, it's um. Yeah. What's it called again? I've forgotten his name now. Uh, yeah, so have I. Yeah. Uh, but yes, it was. <laughs> it was yeah, a reskin. It was a it? Japanese. It was a Japanese yeah. game that was reskin, wasn't it? Yeah. So um, yeah, that's what we're playing. Good stuff. Excellent. Mm. Yeah. Um, right. So uh, th- uh, thanks again, Vic, for joining us. It's been been an absolute no, no pleasure, mate. Thanks for no. having us. Uh, thank you <coughs> for your patience with all the technical problems we had earlier. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, as I said, uh, you know, Microsoft only paid nine billion for it. So, um, yeah, what, what do you expect? Yeah. <laughs> well, exactly. Yeah. So, um, Tibbs, where can pop quiz? Where can people find us? Everywhere. Or oh, everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. Um, anywhere that good podcasts are found. Uh, you can also find us on Twitter yeah. at Podumup. Yep. Uh, Pod them up at gmail dot com. Is that the one? That's the one. Yeah, we we do have. A, I haven't looked at that website that I'm supposed to be looking at. So uh, <laughs> I will try and do that uh, soon for you. Yeah, um, there is a website, but uh, it's it's <coughs> it's top secret. For it's top secret. I need to uh, design it when I get a spare moment. <laughs> um, we're on YouTube as well. Um, so oh yeah, yeah. We are on YouTube. I'm going to put this episode up on YouTube as well. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. Um, uh, uh, Vic, your your website again, just in case anyone uh, missed it. Retroelectromodels.com. Yeah, go and check uh, it out. Also on Facebook and Twitter, and um, we have stores on Amazon and eBay as well. If anyone uh, would prefer to buy from one of the established places, excellent. And the official Brilliant. Sega store as well. I That's right. Yeah, I saw that today. Actually, yeah. Yep. Yep. On the official Sega store. I think they're currently out of stock. Actually, so oh, uh, they? Oh, okay. If, if, if someone desperately wants one, um, they can get it from our store. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, well, again, we wish you all the luck with it. It was It's a great model. We can't wait to see what you're coming up with next. And, um, yeah, brilliant stuff. It's been a pleasure. Okay, thanks, guys. All right, everyone, take it easy. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.